Welcome back to the Magical Mystery Talk. This is Mark Devlin, the host, and that means that I don't need to know nearly as much as the other two contributors to this show, because I can just bat it all over to them. We're talking Desiree, the proprietor of the Number Nine's blog, once again over there in California. Welcome back, Desiree. Hello, hello. Thanks for having me back. Okay, and also over the other side of England from me, it's Matt Sergio of the Occult Beatles and Conspiro Media blog sites. Welcome back, Matt. Hello, 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 hello. <laughs> now, what are we on? What is this? Episode six, seven? Something like that. I think it might be seven, I think. I'm not sure. It depends if you're the John Lennon 80th. Yeah, the two parter. Yeah, I think it might be seven if you include the two parter as a two parter. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure, though. I'm, I'm really not sure. Well, anyway, we do these when we can. We're all busy. We've all got other things going on, and it takes us a while to regroup sometimes. I think we only did one show in 2021, so <laughs> this one is probably overdue. But here we are. <laughs> Just a bit. Yeah. <laughs> Just a Lots bit. Lots to talk about. Lots of things have come across our radar, all Beatles related, and from a sort of conspiratorial, esoteric perspective, which is what we do. So... I thought we would start with some interesting stuff regarding that famous pilgrimage that the Beatles made to India in February 68 to study transcendental meditation under the Maharishi. We've got some links to the KGB and CIA and lots of other good stuff there. So where should we start with this? Well, I think the reason that we're talking about this um, is because a film came out in... um well, 2021, I think it was. May, I think it was premiered, and it was called <laughs> The Beatles and India. And it's a documentary that, yeah, it looks into the, 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 the visit that the Beatles uh, took to uh, the ashram, uh, the Maharishi's ashram in Rishikesh in India. In I think it was March 68, but don't hold me to that. I might be wrong. Uh, I think it was March of 68. Um, yeah. End of February, almost exactly about this time. Oh, right. In okay. Yeah. End of February, okay. into March. Right. Okay. And yeah, this, this film, um, it, it looks into that visit, but um, I've, I've seen the film. Um, you can get it. It's, it's streaming at the minute. It, it premiered in May in the UK. And then a few months later, I think it was in October time, it, it started streaming on various uh, platforms. And you can also get it on DVD now in the UK, but I'm not sure about the rest of the world. I'm not sure as we speak today on February the 28th, 2022, as to what the release um, um, details are with regards to the rest of the world. I but haven't it's, uh, been able to see it. You haven't been able to see it. I know I, I sent you a link, didn't I? A streaming link and it wouldn't, it wouldn't go up. It wouldn't play for you, would it? Nope. I had to have an address in the UK in order to view it. Right. So I don't know what's going on. I have heard, though, that HBO have picked up the rights to it, Home Box Office, and that's an American company. So I think they're going to be taking it on. So that presumably means it will be screened in the US. And also Channel 4 in the UK have bought the rights to it. So it will be screened on British TV at some point. But um, yeah, it's, it's not only about the Beatles in India during that visit to study meditation under the Maharishi, but it's also about the Beatles and India with regards to their relationship to Indian culture, music, the whole, the whole shebang, basically, from... It takes us right back to the 1940s, actually, um, because we've all... You know, I think it's fair to say that, according to most mainstream accounts, the story that's, that we've always been told is, is that George Harrison was basically the one, wasn't he? He was the guy that um, turned the Beatles on to uh, Indian mysticism, and in turn, they then turned the Western world, the so-called Western world, into to Indian mysticism. And that, is, that by and large, is true. But, the, the, but according to the mainstream story is, is that George Harrison began to get turned on to this stuff during the 1960s when he was in the Beatles. But there is a reference in this film. It takes us right back to the 1940s. And, and there's, a, there's a little anecdote where they talk about George Harrison's mum. Whilst she was carrying George in her womb, she used to listen to the radio and she used to listen especially to shows on the radio that played Indian music. So in a kind of you know, interesting way, I think that what they're suggesting in the film is, is that George was picking this up in the womb, you know, that he had a spiritual connection to this, this, this music and, and the culture from, from right. even before he was born, you know, but um, yeah, so this, this film gives us 
the entire story of the Beatles and India, not just them going to India, but also them meeting the Maharishi a year earlier in 67, and, their, and also the, the, uh, the sitar, the Indian instrument, the sitar, which you can hear on Norwegian Wood from 1965 on that track. So it's, but yeah, I mean, most of the film is based on the Indian trip, but there's, there's other stuff attached to it as well. And during the um, documentary, you get a very brief mention of these allegations that were going around at the time in 1968 in India that the Maharishi was somehow connected to the CIA. And um, the director of the film, I think he's written a book and it's called Across the Universe, The Beatles in India. And, and you can find an article, an extract of the book online. You can find uh, where he goes into this, these allegations. I'm just going to read a very brief paragraph of it. Uh, and the director's name, oh, I know I'm going to pronounce this wrong. Ajoy Bose. Oh, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. Bose, yeah. Bose, is it? Okay. okay. Anyway, he says, in, he states in this very long article, he states in 1968, the elected lower house of the Indian parliament, the opposition went up in arms, alleging that the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi was in cahoots with the CIA and that many of his guests from abroad were actually foreign spies. Uh, and the charge was led by communist members of parliament who formed a sizable bloc in the opposition benches and were supported by the socialists who too felt that something fishy was happening in Rishikesh, which of course is where the ashram, where the meditation, where the Beatles were studying meditation under the Maharishi, it was at uh, Rishikesh it was based. Rishikesh. Um, Rishikesh, yes. Um, and if you go on and read this article, which is, uh, as I say, you can find online, um, and, and it's under the title of When Indian Parliamentarians Saw a CIA Plot in the Beatles' Stay at Maharishi Mahesh Yogi's Ashram. That's the title of the article. And if you go on and read it, it, it um, makes reference to some 1968 newspaper headlines from India, where all these allegations have been pr were printed out in March of that year. And I just thought, do you know what, Let, let's go on a hunt here. Let's, let's see if we can find it. And do you know what, I did, I found them. I actually found the press cuttings. There is, somebody has very kindly put up a, a blog page where they posted up all these newspaper uh, cuttings from the very newspaper reports that were out at the time. Mm -hmm. And from what I can gather from having read these newspaper cuttings is that many of the allegations that were being led in the parliament, in the Indian parliament at the time were being, there was a collective of people basically who were, who were suspicious of the Maharishi. And they, as I say, they formed this collective, but the one guy, or there were two uh, politicians who were basically doing the talking for the group in parliament, um, making um, suggestions to the Indian government in parliament, um, making suggestions to the government that something should be done about this, something should, that this should be investigated. And one of those um, was the left communist member, as he's called in one of these um, uh, newspaper headlines by the name of K. Anirudan. Um, and from what I can gather, it's the allegations were born from a number of ingredients that on their own don't seem that suspicious. But when they're put together, it would seem that there is something fishy, as that mm -hmm. article states, fishy going on with uh, the Maharishi and uh, his, his ashram in Rishikesh. Um, for example, there was um, in 1966, just a few years before um, the allegations were made, there was um, reports that uh, a, trans a transmitter had been found in Rishikesh, not, not at the ashram, but at, um, near a factory in Rishikesh. It was um, two transistor trans receiver sets, and they were found in the possession of a West German national. And that instantly got people suspicious. That got the police suspicious because it wasn't owned by an Indian national. It was actually owned by a West German national. So apparently what happened was the police in January of 66 seized these um, trans receiver sets to find out what their range was and what they were being used for, whether they were being used to pass secret messages to a, a foreign uh, country. And apparently after tests, according to the, one of the reports, after tests, their range was found to be two to three miles in flat terrain. So they weren't found to be suspicious at all. But um, yeah, in 1968, um, the, the politician uh, K. Anirudan raised this again and said, you know, it, it, this is one of the ingredients that when it's put together with everything else that he'd found, looked a little bit fishy. And one of the other things that he found, and, and I'm going to read a little bit again from something here. This is from one of the 
um, the Indian reports under the headline of Rishikesh, hotbed of espionage. Um, Rishikesh has become a hotbed of espionage thronged by beetles yearning for Nirvana and intelligence agents nibbling at India's security, according to K. Anurudam. He referred to the reports of some American intelligence agents staying in the ashram of Mahesh Yogi. Um, yes, yeah, so he, he went on to allege that in the course, uh, he went on to allege that foreigners, including an American Central Intelligence Agency official, were using Rishikesh as a center for spying. And in another uh, newspaper headline from 68, from, from India, from March 68, an actual name is given to a possible CIA agent. And that, na that name that was given is a Mr. Russell Dean Brines. And apparently, well, actually, there's no apparently to it. He was an American journalist. And one of his uh, jobs as an American journalist was as a, I think he was a correspondent at the White House. So, um, yeah, that, that it's alleged that this Russell Dean Brines went to the ashram, I think a day or two before the Beatles arrived there. I might have got that wrong, but he certainly he was he was certainly there in early 68 and he stayed for a total of about two days. Um, and what happened was, well, what happened was some journalists went to see the Maharishi at his ashram to, to question him about this Russell Dean Brines and these allegations that he was CIA. And, and, and of course, the Maharishi said, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. This, this is baseless rubbish. You know, I, I don't know who this Mr. Russell Dean Brines is. Uh, at which point his spokespeople said, yes, a Mr. Russell Dean Brines did come to the ashram. I mean, he stayed for a couple of days, but the Maharishi didn't know him personally. He didn't know who he was. And they claimed that he came, that, that this Brines came to the ashram basically to ask for an interview with the Maharishi in order to write an article about him, but that the Maharishi passed him down. He's, he stated that he was too busy to see this Brines character and that there wasn't going to be an interview and yeah and so there wasn't an interview and then after a couple of days the spokespeople said that this guy left but according to one of these um press reports there are some allegations made by a quote unquote or should i say not Anne, but quote unquote police sources okay with and these police sources are rather suspicious of this brian's character um to quote again from another um, newspaper headline it says here that Mr. Brines carried and this is according to police sources Mr. Brines carried an accreditation card by Mr. Rowley a Mr. Rowley who was allegedly chief of the US secret services the card said Mr. Brines was correspondent of the Continental Press Incorporated and covered the White House a local police officer who for obvious reasons prefers to remain anonymous told the Indian press that Mr. Brines's links with the Secret Service, presumably CIA, had not been contradicted by the American embassy so far. Now, ordinarily, the embassy quickly denies such reports appearing in the press. And this anonymous source or sources hastened to add that he was not implying that Mr. Brines was connected with espionage. So this, this source isn't, you know, not implying that Mr. Brines was connected with espionage, um, but nothing concrete had come to his notice so far so he was keeping his mind open um yeah and just to to close to close off with regards to these these indian reports um actually mccartney was was uh, approached by the press with these allegations whilst he was at the ashram <laughs> and he said do you think england is coming back to take over india and we have come to spy for it <laughs> um but yeah, uh, yeah. He, and I mean, he was I, the only one of the Beatles that commented anything close to that, which I thought was kind of interesting. Everybody else kind of, you know, didn't have anything to say about it. But of course, Paul had something to say about it. Yeah, and it's and and, and of course it was something to 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 defend the Maharishi, not to say, oh yeah, there's you know, but yeah, he's he's always defending. Or who recorded he? spies like us? Yeah, right. exactly. <laughs> Exactly, spies like us, yeah. which is probably something we're going to be going on to uh, a little bit later. But yeah, I mean, John Lennon apparently was was suspicious. Um, this right, is I suppose that's why they left early. They were supposed to be there three months or something like that, and they ended up leaving after a couple of weeks because John had said that you know he felt that the Maharishi um, said inappropriate things to Mir Mia Farrow or something to that extent. Yeah, it's all a bit shady, that isn't it? It was yeah. apparently. Um, 
they, they stayed, I don't know how long John and George stayed. They were the last to leave. Paul left a little bit earlier and then Ringo left much earlier. Right. Um, and yeah, there was allegations that the Maharishi had been um, inappropriate with certain female members of the ashram. Um, yeah, Mia Farrow was there, as was Donovan and Mike Love from the Beach mm -hmm. Boys and Prudence as well, Prudence Farrow, Mia Farrow's sister. But yeah, Mia Farrow in more recent years has actually said that she was the one that was actually opportuned by the Maharishi. She's actually claimed in the press, she's actually come out in the press and stated it. She right. said that the Maharishi made a pass at her. But yeah, there were rumours going around at the time that the Maharishi was a little bit, yeah, he was a little bit that way inclined. So they all decided to, so George and John were forced to leave. But it's also come to light that, uh, that these were false rumours. Right. That they'd actually been planted by Magic Alex, who was the electronics guy of Apple, the Beatles company, and who was, was also very friendly with John. And he was at the ashram as well, if I'm not mistaken. And apparently right. it, was, it was Magic Alex, uh, who was called Magic Alex. Obviously that wasn't his name. He was a Greek guy, <laughs> but they called him Magic Alex because he used to come up with these inventions, these electronic inventions, these weird and wonderful things. That, um, yeah, so they called him Magic Alex and he worked for Apple Electronics. But um, yeah, he was the one that apparently figure. started this. Apparently he's the one that started the rumours, so it said, falsely. Um, and yeah, but oh, I don't know what the true story about all that is. It's, but. it's very strange. It's like they go back on what they said and then they come back to it later. And like you said, Mia Farrow comes out much later and, and admits to it. And so it's like, where, what's the real story there? And then you George know. made up late in later years, he made up with the Maharishi and so right. did Paul and, and they sort of apologized to him and said, we're so sorry for believing all those rumors. It was obviously magic Alex because he was getting jealous that John Lennon, his mate, his friend was getting too pally with the Maharishi and he was getting under his influence. So it was basically magic Alex's way of stirring the dirt, basically um, stirring the shit, as we might say, in order right. to cause bad feeling to make John walk out, you know, by, bringing out these rumors about you know women and maharishi and but um i, I don't i don't know it's all very mucky isn't it that who knows what, what actually went on there but apparently john lennon late in later years not not that long afterwards actually um did have um suspicions that the maharishi was cia and this is um according to ram das who was formerly richard alpert who, of course, worked with Timothy Leary at Harvard on all those um, psychedelic experiments at Harvard, some of which were linked to MK Ultra, And he mm -hmm. later became Ram Das and went out on his own and pretty much, I, I think, yeah, he, he sort of, he was a partnership with Timothy Leary, but I think he went his own way. But so, yeah, CIA he, he asset, I suspect. <clears throat> yes, well, there you go. So it's very interesting that Ram Das would claim in an interview in later years um, again, I've got the quote here. He says, both John Lennon and Allen Ginsberg, the beat poet, um, have told me that Maharishi Mahesh Yogi seems to have some sort of CIA backing. And he goes on to say, I wouldn't be at all surprised if he was a CIA thing. I see that the spiritual program could be used by the government in a way to undercut revolutionary or to undercut disruptive things because it tends to cool kids out and keep the scene quiet. Right. Um, which is very interesting coming from Ram Das, isn't it? Because the, the be same to know. accusations a bit, he would be one to yeah. know, exactly. Because you've got Timothy Leary, who's, who was accused, even in the 60s. I mean, when we talk about the alternative media now and the way that the alternative media now has re-examined the 1960s and seen that it could have been, um, very probably was a social engineering experiment. But people were actually saying that back in the 60s, there were people in the so-called radical movement at the time who were saying this about Leary. So I find it very, quite interesting that you've got, on one side, you've got Leary, who was telling people to turn on, tune in, drop out. And he was actually telling people in the 60s, hey, look, guys, don't protest against the Vietnam War. Don't burn your draft cards. Don't play the game, the political game. Just turn on, tune in, drop drop out, go inward, forget all that stuff, forget Vietnam. So you've got him on one side being accused by radicals at the time and now by the likes of us in the alternative media, the so-called alternative scene, pretty much saying the same thing that this guy was put there to effectively uh, nullify the anti-Vietnam war movement to just and take it. loads of LSD was part of his take, central message as yeah, well. <laughs> exactly, by taking loads of LSD. And then on the other side, You've got the Maharishi telling people, again, it's being accused that, um, 
yeah, that he's doing it by telling people to meditate. Right. Uh, don't, don't, because the interesting thing about the Maharishi is, um, and, and, and the thing with the Maharishi is, I don't know about you guys, but up until about maybe three or four years ago, when I started looking into him again, I mean, I was, I've been brought up with the main, you know, according to the mainstream view, the Maharishi is this kind of peace loving guy, this guru, it's all about meditation, wearing long robes. And, you know, you see the documentaries and anytime there's a new, any news stories about him in the past, it was always holding flowers. He was always had flowers, garlands of flowers around him and he was peace and love and all this kind of stuff. But apparently what I found out quite recently is that he was actually quite right wing. And not only was he very right wing, but he was, um, he was supportive of the Vietnam War, which is something that I, n I never knew. Um, I've got another quote here. This is from many years from now. Funnily enough, this is, this is deemed to be the official Paul McCartney biography because it was written by his friend, Barry Miles, who is <laughs> another um, suspicious character that we talked about in the past because of his connections to the London counterculture. But... Um, to state from his book, and this is him stating this, in America, he says, where he concentrated his efforts, he's talking about the Maharishi, many students were shocked with the Maharishi's attitude. When they asked him if they should resist the draft to avoid killing fellow humans, the Maharishi replied, we should obey the elected leaders of the country. They are representatives of the people and have more information at their disposal and are more qualified to make the right decisions. His politics, and this is Barry Miles going on, his politics were those of the American establishment. In fact, many of his meetings in the USA broke up because his youthful audience walked out appalled at his message. For example, after a meeting at UCLA in September 1967, one student commented, if his opinions reflect what 20 years of meditation will do for you, I estimate that 40 will raise you to the stature of Hitler. And apparently Miles himself, because as I say, he was, he was friends with John and Paul, as we know, we've talked about this in, in previous podcasts. Barry Miles is very, very central to the London counterculture scene through his association with the Indica Gallery, where John and Yoko are said to have met, and Paul's funding of this gallery and bookshop <laughs> and various other things. But uh, yeah, apparently Miles, in many years from now, this book, he, he states that he actually warned John and Paul about the Maharishi, when they were starting to get involved with him in 1967, they actually warned him not to get involved with him because he had these right-wing um, connections to politicians in India, uh, to which apparently Barry Miles claims that both John and Paul dismissed, dismissed his, um, his um, suspicions and just said, ah, so what? You know, so what? <laughs> but um, yeah, and that, if you look online with regards to John Lennon, there is actually a song um, called the Maharishi Song um it's a demo it's a demo and um i think I they even... didn't they change that uh i think the sexy sadie song was supposed to be the original lyrics yeah. were actually the maharishi and then they changed it to sexy sadie at the last you know before they officially uh released it that's right um john lennon but... was going to call it oh maharishi what have you done and yeah, then george, it, was... it was george harrison said come on man let's not get let's not get too personal let's cool it a little bit Right. So um, he changed too it to one cult leader to another from the Maharishi right. to Charlie Manson. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> apparently, there, there, is a, there is a demo. And Both with CIA this. links as well. Yeah. There is, there is a demo where, actually, where John actually makes reference to this. The thing with John Lennon is sometimes, you know, he is an enigma. We've talked about that before as well, what an enigma he is. You, you don't know sometimes whether he's, he's joking when he says things or whether he's actually being serious. Right. Or what's going on? But or if he's just trying to give attention. Yeah, you just you just don't know sometimes. But apparently, he did record a, a demo, and it's called the Maharishi song, um, and you can find it online. And, and from what I can gather, it was recorded sometime in March 1969. Um, it's it's actually a rap. It's John Lennon playing a guitar, and he's not singing. He's kind of rapping more than he is singing. And um, yeah, Yoko's in it as well. Um, <laughs> Bad luck. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, well, well, what a surprise! But thankfully, she's not in it very much. But yeah, in in part of the lyrics, he says uh, it's about the Maharishi, and in it, he says um, a little daddy with a beard telling stories of heaven as if he knew. You could never pin him down, but he often spread rumours through his right hand man who used to be with the CIA. 
So that, that could be John just making jokey references to, the, to those reporters turning up in India when they were at the ashram. Mm-hmm. I don't know. But, um, well, John seemed yeah. to know a lot about the CIA because in the Playboy interviews in 1980, he made that comment about, uh, let us thank the CIA for putting the LSD out there into the counterculture, you know, words to that effect. Yeah, yeah. And hearing of the Maharishi's possible links to the CIA makes me think of World Vision, the charity that Mark Chapman is said to have been involved Mm -hmm. with, and that was a front for the CIA also. So it seems the CIA has its tentacles everywhere. Everywhere. And uh, it crops up in the Beatles story in quite a few few points. Well, what about this? And I know, Desiree, you've, you've looked into this in one of your articles on your website. What about Patty Boyd, Patty Harris and George's Um, wife it was Patty and this is from according to Patty herself who introduced the Beatles initially to the Maharishi right she she went to see the Maharishi without George at some event in 66 I think it was or maybe early 67 and it was she who came back and said to George hey I just went and saw this great guy called the Maharishi you really should go and check him out so that's when he and the Beatles went and publicly saw him and got to know him and if you look at Patty's background, I mean, um, I know you've looked into this, Desiree. I, yeah. I've mentioned it very briefly on, on one, in an article on my website. Um, just to quote here briefly, um, her mother's brother, this is from the book Beatles 66, The Revolutionary Year. Uh, it's by Steve Turner. Really good book, actually, if you want to get into that. That's a really good book. According to that book, her mother's brother, uh, George's mother's brother, was John Drysdale, who was a former foreign office diplomat who had worked in the Gold Coast, which is now Ghana. And um, yeah, and he actually gave Patty away to George at their wedding. Um, And uh, (laughs) Patty was from a prosperous middle class background. The men on her mother's side had served in the army in India and her great grandfather Mm -hmm. had been rewarded for his service with indigo and sugar plantations. And I think there's some royalty links as well, but um, yeah, I yeah, think so. she was, I think she's also related to Eisenhower, American president Eisenhower wow. as well. So there's lots of um, links there to, you know, royalty as well as American political <clears throat> figures, et cetera, et cetera. So she's, she's very well innovated. <laughs> so it does and make you wonder. Too, her sister, uh, Jenny Boyd, was at the uh, Maharishi camp as well. And um, there's, there's lots, lots going on with her sister as well. She, was, she had an affair, I believe, with uh, Mick Fleetwood, I believe, if I yeah, remember I think, yeah, correctly. That rings, and, yeah, that rings a bell. And uh, Magic Alex actually um, was completely in love with Patty Boyd's sister. And... Um, there's, you know, some rumors that that's actually um, a big uh, part of why the Beatles left as well, because of uh, Jenny Boyd, who was also there, of course, with Patty Boyd and et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's, all, it's all just a big question mark on that whole, that whole uh, excursion with the Beatles. So lots of strange oddities going on. Well, I think it's really worth mentioning um, Yuri Bresmanov if we're going to talk about the Maharishi and um, possible connections to uh, secret intelligence. Yeah. Uh, Yuri Bresman, uh, Bezmanov, um, I think is how you pronounce his name. Um, you can find Bezmanov. this online, actually. Yeah, Bezmanov. Uh, you can find this online, actually. He did an interview. I think it must have been in the US in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, where he goes into detail about what he used to do. He was basically, he was a former KGB agent and he worked via the, the Soviet embassy uh, until he defected in 1970, I think it was. And basically what his job was in the KGB was to, he was perception management. That was basically his job was to, to take care of perception management, to make the Soviet Union look less like dictators and less like a tyrannical um organization um to to the west to the so-called west so basically that was his job was perception management to to um uh, encourage uh, journalists from the so-called west to visit the soviet union where he would get them drunk he gave it during the interview he gives a, a one particular um example where he gets um i think it's an indian actually it was an indian poet who was who had a soviet um, uh, sympathies and they invited him over him, him and his delegation I think 
um, to to uh, the Soviet Union for a visit for meetings and what have you, and they get they got all these people drunk. But he but Yuri doesn't get drunk. He drinks as much as they do. But he claims what he did is he took a pill, which stopped him from getting as drunk as they did. So he would get he would drink as much as they did, but he would stay relatively sober and he would watch what they'd get up to. And if they did anything that was embarrassing, then the next day he would come to them with the photographs or the tape recordings or the film or whatever. And say blackmail. to them, blackmail, basically. Yeah, say, hey, look, if you don't go back to the West, the so-called West, and, and, and report us in a good light, then, you know, then we're going to, you know, do whatever we're going to do. So basically that was his job. And he spent a lot of time in India. He was the Jeffrey Epstein was, of his day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But not, yeah, but not quite as um, yucky. As yeah. extreme, yeah. yeah. Yeah, as extreme, to put it mildly. So, yeah, so it, during this interview, he talks about the Maharishi and you can actually find the video. The full interview is about an hour and a half, I think. But you can actually find the small part where he talks about the Maharishi as well. Someone's edited it and put it up on, on YouTube. Um, and basically what he says, he, he was with the Maharishi. He was there in the early 60s. He actually went to see the Maharishi to basically spy on him just to see what, what, he, what, what this whole thing was all about, this meditation thing in, in India. Uh, the KGB was even curious about this gentleman. It may look innocent. Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, a great spiritual leader, or maybe a great charlatan and crook, depending on which, from which side you're looking at him. Uh, Beatles were trained at his ashram in India how to meditate. Mia Farrow and, and other... Uh, useful idiots from Hollywood visited his uh, school and they returned back to the United States absolutely zonked out of their minds with marijuana, hashish, and crazy ideas of meditation. To meditate, in other words, to isolate oneself from the current social and political issues of your own country. To get into your own bubble, to forget about troubles of the world. Obviously, KGB was very fascinated with such a beautiful school such a, a brainwashing center for stupid Americans. I was dispatched by the KGB to check what kind of VIP Americans attend this school. My function was to discover what kind of people from the United States attend this school. And we discovered that, yes, there are some influential members of family, uh, uh, public opinion makers of the United States, who come back with the crazy stories about Indian philosophy, Indians themselves look up upon them as idiots, useful idiots. To say nothing about KGB who looked at them as, as, as extremely naive, misguided people. Obviously, a VIP, say a wife of, of, of a congressman or, or a prominent Hollywood personality, after, the, after being trained in that school, is much more instrumental in the hands of, of manipulators of public opinion and KGB than a normal person who, who understands, who, who looks through this, this, uh, this, this type of, of uh, fake religious training. So why would they be more susceptible to manipulation? I just mentioned that because, you see, a, a person who is too much involved in, 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 in introspective meditation, you see, if you carefully look what, what Maharishi Mahesh Yogi is teaching to, to Americans, is that all, most of the problems, most of the burning issues of today can be solved simply by meditating. Don't, don't, don't rock the boat. Don't get involved. Just sit down, look at your navel and meditate. And the things, due to some strange logic, due to cosmic vibration, will, will, will settle down by themselves. This is exactly what the KGB and Marxist-Leninist propaganda want from Americans, to distract their uh, opinion, uh, attention, and mental energy from real issues of the United States into a non-issues, into a non-world, non-existent uh, harmony. Obviously, it's more beneficial for the Soviet aggressors to have a bunch of duped Americans than Americans who are self-conscious, healthy, uh, physically fit, and alert to, to the reality. Mm -hmm. Maharishi Mahesh Yogi obviously is not on the payroll of the KGB, but w whether he knows it or not, he contributes greatly to demoralization of American society. And he's not the only one. There are hundreds of those gurus who come to, you, to your country to capitalize on naivete and stupidity of, of Americans. It's a fashion. 
It's a fashion to meditate. It's a fashion not to be involved. So obviously, you can see that if, if KGB were uh, that curious, if they paid my trip, if they assigned me to that, to that strange job, obviously they were very much fascinated. They were convinced that that type of, of, of brainwashing is very efficient and instrumental in demoralization of the United States. So it's what, like I was saying earlier about Leary was suspected of bringing about this um, this inaction towards the Vietnam War during the 60s and various other um, injustices by making would-be protesters take LSD. And then on the other side, you've got the Maharishi being accused of doing it through non-drugs, but mm. through quote-unquote navel-gazing, you know, not getting involved, but looking inward and yeah. So it's yeah. kind of like the double edge. It's the two sides, isn't it? Right. It's interesting that back in Besmanov's day, the PR spin regarding Russia was that it was this uh, benevolent, well-meaning nation that wanted to contribute to culture and society and all this sort of thing. And yeah. now in 2022, as we record this, all the PR and propaganda regarding Russia is that it's become the enemy again. It's become the big bad villain of the peace waging war in Ukraine and all the rest of it. And, you know, it's all propaganda and mind control. But uh, the nature it of it around changes it's, from age to yeah. age. Yeah. yeah. Interestingly, during that, uh, that, that interview, which you can find online, as I say, he says that uh, people are misguided. I mean, he, he's talking about the KGB when he was in it. So this, the 1960s mainly. So it may have changed a little bit, but I su suspect it hasn't. I think he says that people are misguided. They think when they think of espionage, they think, that it's all people dressing up and spying and, and you know, and guns and, and, and violence, stuff. 007 stuff. But basically right. he says that's about 15% of it. The rest of it is perception management, fooling the mind, you know, propaganda, mm -hmm. false information, media, Edward the use Bernays of the media. Style. Yeah, Edward Bernays style, yeah. Wasn't mm -hmm. he the one that came up with the word propaganda? The father of propaganda, yeah. Yeah, exactly, the godfather and all that. So, so yeah. So, guys, we've got loads of stuff on McCartney. So is there anything else to add on the Maharishi stuff uh, before we move on? Or should we get on to the McCartney business? No, I just think basically just to, to, to put a, a cap on it, I suppose, from my perspective. I mean, there's plenty more that could be said, but just to keep it relevant. Um, I, think the, I think many people, you know, many researchers of today are, are and maybe in the 60s as well, maybe it was the case in the 60s, are, are, are accusing the Beatles of, being part of some agenda, not only to push LSD in order to bring about the social engineering, the malevolent social engineering, i.e. part of which is to make the youth of America and Britain and the so-called West not um, retaliate against the Vietnam War and, and civil injustice and, and all the rest of it. But um, yeah, it's, it's not just through the use of LSD, but also through the use of meditation. And because before the Beatles, it was, there, you know, meditation, the so-called East, you know, Eastern mysticism. It wasn't that main, it wasn't mainstream as far as I'm aware. It wasn't a mainstream right. thing. And it was the Beatles and their influence that made Eastern mysticism and meditation and the likes of the Maharishi absolutely popular. So right. if you're looking to say that this, you know, that the Maharishi was part of some CIA um, or secret intelligence plot to, to, um, you know, to destroy any effective um, protest against governments, then if the Maharishi is part of it, then maybe the Beatles are part of it as well as part of this social engineering thing. So it's not only the LSD that the Beatles were openly pushing, but of course meditation. So it's, yeah. Right. So that's Sorry, Desiree, carry on. Oh, that's okay. I was just going to add on there too. You know, um, the Beatles could have completely done this in a, in a blackout private scenario, but no, they were filmed the entire time pretty much that they were there, they had cameras on site. So it was like they wanted to have this log. They, you know, they made pretty much the entire White Album on their trip there. It was a very publicized thing. And if you go on YouTube, you can actually find all the old footage of all of these news outlets that covered the Beatles at the Maharishi camp in India when they were there. And there's a two hour YouTube video of um, just a rehashing of all of these different news outlets from France, from Italy, from the United States, from all over the world that, that covered the Beatles there. You know, if it was truly about a spiritual journey for the Beatles and learning um, 
you know, some inner peace and or whatnot, it it wouldn't have been such a public, um, you know, a public eye type of thing. They could have kept the media out of the ashram. There's there is no reason that they could should have been there unless they were invited there. And so, you know, it just goes to show me that that this was absolutely um, planned to 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 bring the Beatles and and meditation and all of that into the public eye. It wasn't a you know, it wasn't just something that happened. It was absolutely planned and and made to be this way. So well, John Lennon was asked in October on October 9th, actually his birthday, 1967 by the daily sketch. He was asked, are you deliberately using the power of the Beatles to spread the word about transcendental meditation? And he answers, yes, we want the younger generation, especially to know about it. And in another quote, he says, we want to learn the meditation thing properly so we can propagate it and sell the whole idea to everyone. Right. Can't get, <laughs> and can't sell get being the, being the key word there. Yeah. Sell exactly. Yeah. Spiritual isn't about making money. It's about, you know, healing yourself and being, you know, a better version of yourself, not selling records and movies. And but the thing is, is the United Nations through uh, an initiative called the World Goodwill sells meditation for a one world order. Right. It's actually stated on their website. It's stated on, um, on, on the World Goodwill's website. No, it's on Does the Lucius Trust. Of one world order. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. So... <laughs> <laughs> no. A lyric to imagine, apart from anything else. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> right. It's interesting how different agendas seem to be selected for different assets of the system. So if indeed the Beatles and the Rolling Stones were both uh, products of the Tavistock Institute, which I suspect they were, uh, it was never going to work with the Rolling Stones pushing meditation, really, was it? Their image was all wrong. They're pushing drinking and taking hard drugs, whereas the Beatles... Right were always the milder version of them and more palatable to mainstream society. So, yeah, they were the group that was going to be able to get across the idea of med meditation to the masses, right. if any. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, um, it, again, it's the, the two sides. It's like the, the Leary and, and the Maharishis, and it's two sides of the same coin. They're both dialectics. doing different things. Yeah, the dialectics, they're, do, they're doing two different things, but the, the goal is kind of like the same it reaches the same road basically they're coming from a different road but they're coming they're going to they're going to meet each other in at the same road you know a different one but that, that meets meets into one yeah so yeah okay so lots to get through let's move on to some mccartney related stuff then so november saw the release of paul mccartney's new part lyrics part memoirs book the lyrics so what did we take from this matt <laughs> Oh my goodness. I've actually got, the, I actually bought them. I'm ashamed to say I did buy them. They're, they're heavy tomes, as they might have said in the old days. Um, and I'm actually lifting one up now. I um, don't know if you can hear that, but um, yeah, I, I've picked out a couple of little bits and pieces that might be of interest to us. Um, one of which is about cli so-called climate change. Um, there's a song that he recorded for Egypt Station. Remember that album from 2018, the one that's absolutely emblazoned with ancient Egyptian symbols everywhere. Oh, yes. um, Paul Mc yeah, his solo album from that year. Um, well, apparently one of the songs on there is called Despite Repeated Warnings. And it's one of the lyrics that he talks about or that he writes about in this book, The Lyrics, which is basically a book which is part biography and part um, explanatory book about some of his song, song lyrics from the 1950s onwards. Of course, some listening to this, or many, I dare say, listening to this would say, well, it's all lies because after 1966, it wasn't Paul McCartney, it was Billy or whoever. So, but whatever, for argument's sake, let's just say Paul, okay, for argument's sake. So, okay, to read from the page where he, he writes about, uh, uh, despite repeated warnings, I've, I've picked out a couple of um, paragraphs that might interest you. Um, right. He says, there was a president named Trump who thought that climate change was a hoax, one that the Chinese had created. Sadly, he was not the only one to ignore this, um, this threat. I recall reading a newspaper article in Japan that stated, nobody's doing anything about it, despite repeated warnings. I liked that phrase. That was enough to get me started on a new song. And I'm skimming right through to the bottom of the page just to uh, finish this one off. And if you look at the impact someone like Greta Thunberg has had, it's inspirational. In one year, she went from protesting the climate crisis outside her school by herself 
to attracting crowds in the tens of thousands listening to her speak. The climate crisis is rightly a huge concern amongst her generation. So maybe those repeated warnings are starting to get through. Yes, Paul, they listened to your song, Paul, and they thought, you know, what a great song that is. Um, let's, let's all, you know, get up. Yeah, right, whatever. Let's all get up in arms because of that song. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's just one of them. I don't know what your, th <laughs> what your <laughs> thoughts are about that one. Um, don't get me started but, on Greta Thunberg. Yeah. <laughs> And the other one, the other little piece that I found in his book, um, it's perhaps a little bit more, um, uh, yeah, explosive. He, he goes on to talk about John Lennon and the, the song Happy Christmas War is Over. Um, and dearie, dearie me, uh, I'm just trying to find it here now. Here we go. Yeah, he's talking about the book, uh, the song Too Many People, um, which is taken from the Ram album, which was his second solo post Beatles solo album which came out in 71 um, and too many people has since been regarded as a diss track it is basically mm -hmm. Paul singing against John because this was at the time that the split had happened with the Beatles and they were having public arguments amongst each other John and Paul were arguing amongst each other publicly through the music press and slagging each other off and all this kind of thing so he says Okay, too many people. So he wrote this song and recorded this song for Ram. He says, this song was written when John was firing missiles at me with his songs, and one or two of them were quite cruel. I don't know what he hoped to gain other than punching me in the face. The whole thing really annoyed me, so I decided to turn my missiles onto him too. Um, it was the 90, he says that too many people, as I say, it was the 1970s equivalent of what might, what might be called today a diss track. The idea of too many people preaching practices is definitely aimed at John because that's, that's part of the lyrics of the song. He sings too many people preaching practices. And he says in his book, the lyrics, that's definitely aimed at John, that lyric, telling everyone that they ought to do what he ought to do. I just got fed up with being told what to do by him. So I wrote the song. He went on. The thing is, so much that John and Yoko held to be the truth was crap. War is over. Well, no, it isn't. If enough people want the war to be over, it'll be over, John said. I'm not sure that's entirely true. So that was, I thought that was a bit, a bit of, um, I don't know, cruel, but I just thought, wow, what, what, where did that come from? Do you know what I mean? Right. Um, he, he's slightly wrong, actually. His, his memory is obviously playing tricks with him because he says he wrote that song as um, a reply to a couple of diss songs that John had aimed at him. And I'm imagining, uh, pardon the pun, that he's, he's actually talking about the Imagine album, John's Imagine album, because on that, on that album, of course, we've got How Do You Sleep, which is right. deemed to be a diss song against Paul by John. And you've also got Crippled Inside, which is another song that's deemed to be a diss song against Paul. So other than those two songs, I can't think of any other songs during 1970, 71 that John wrote and recorded and released that were actual diss tracks towards Paul. They're the only two I can think of. Problem is, right. like, Paul says that he aimed his song too many people at John because he wrote those songs on Imagine and That's recorded it. them. Yeah, but problem is, Ram came out in May 71 and the Imagine album came out in September of 71. So right. it's obviously this, you know, his memories playing tricks. There's a lot of this with McCartney. I've, I've noticed this whenever I research yeah. any His recollections aren't the sharpest are they and they're not consistent no they're not either. no they're not they're Definitely not very not contradictory consistent. and this it's is almost... consistent with the idea that it's not the real paul of course you know those that exactly adhere to that theory will use this as ammunition exactly that's what i was just about to say it's like two people are talking you know really? two different people are talking about his you know the life of mccartney yeah so those are a couple of bits anyway from the lyrics um you know war is over if you want it I, I don't want to speak on behalf of john too much but i think what john was trying to say is war is it's about intent isn't it it's about if you if if everyone in the world just said look let's just not fight and just use their intent their power of intent the power of vibrational forces you know to to bring about less violence then it, it might work right so i don't think john was saying oh everyone's just gonna like put down their guns and go oh i'm going home now enough of this fighting bye bye you see you know i think Matt, i'm sure either... you remember frankie goes to hollywood from the mid 80s with two tribes right yeah and there was yeah. a 12 inch mix of that song where you've got the spitting image actor for ronald reagan yeah and he just says the line just think of it 
war breaks out and nobody turns up. Exactly. That's, That's probably exactly what he's it. getting at. Yeah, exactly. So Paul's looking at it from a very simplistic <laughs> point of and view. Na- and naive, really. Naive, yeah. Yeah. I just thought that was particularly... I, I didn't see the need. Yeah, or controlled. I just, I don't, I don't know. At least he's being honest, I suppose. You know, he's not sugarcoating his history. But I'm just wondering why he, he had to be so scathing about it. Crap. You know, what, so much of what they held to be the truth was crap. Oh, that's a bit, I don't know. I just don't it's so it's schizophrenic, isn't it? Because you've got that, but then there's some footage that I'm sure you've seen where McCartney's in a studio and he's playing a John Lennon record. I can't remember which one it is. And he starts crying. He starts crying at his memories of John. So on the one hand, you've got that. And on the other hand, he's quite scathing and quite heartless, seemingly, when he refers to John. And how do you reconcile And and also, what about his hit song from the 80s, Play the Pipes of Peace? Paul's song, Play the Pipes of Peace. So we can play the Pipes of Peace, but we can't have war is over what what it's just uh, it doesn't make, make sense tug yeah. of war that's another anti-war song that paul released you know so what's going on here you know matt this might be a good segue into another mccartney uh, thing on the agenda here which is find my way off the mccartney three album because you made the observation that in many of his videos paul has played multiple parts such as yeah. coming oh, up, yeah. Pipes of Peace, the Pipes of Peace video, Spies Like Us, as we mentioned, uh, Ebony yeah. and Ivory. And again, this will feed into the idea that there's been more than one McCartney over the years uh, as a kind of symbolic clue. So, uh, yeah, let's get into Find My Way, shall we? Yeah, what did you think of that video? It's basically, it's, it's, um, it's a remix of a track from McCartney 3, which is like a trilogy of albums that McCartney's released from 1970 onwards, he released McCartney, well, I suppose you could call it McCartney 1, but it wasn't called that at the time, but you had McCartney in 1970, which was his first post-Beatles solo album. Then you Mm -hmm. had McCartney 2 in 1980. Clue, maybe? Exactly, exactly. And then then you've got McCartney 3, which came out in 2020. And basically what all these albums share is that it's just McCartney playing on the songs. It's all him and nobody else. He's playing all the instruments and I think he's written most of the songs, if not all of them. On So it's a trilogy of those kind of self-recorded albums. And yeah, He um, wrote the last one in lockdown because he was a bit bored. <laughs> he he was a know, bit bored. didn't know what to do with himself. So he said, you know, I think I'll make a new album. Call it McCartney 3. Yeah. And he, there was a remix album that came out a, a year ago, I think it was called McCartney Reimagined, mm-hmm. and it was basically all the tracks, and they've been re, redone, remixed, re, you know, rejigged by various artists, and one of whom is Beck, um, and he did the Find My Way song, and they've made a video of that song. Um, okay. Yeah, what do you think of it? <laughs> it it's, it's just, I find it quite creepy. It um, is creepy, it, and it's uncanny. The um, you know that they use that deep deep fake technology on on Beck, supposedly, anyway. And he really, really looks like a very young Paul McCartney in that. Like, it's uncanny. It's like, how... Like, I I can't believe technology is at that point in this. Um, We know that it's been that way for probably a lot longer than we realize. But it's it's really uncanny watching that video. You're just like, wow, that's, that's Paul McCartney in, like, 1964. How is yeah. he singing this song? <laughs> it's just, it's kind of amazing. It's, it's, it's weird. Th- that's why it's I find unsettling it unsettling feeling. Yeah. I, I, that's what unsettles me about it. It's, it's, you've got basically what they did. I think if you, you, you can find the behind the scenes of it where they actually, it shows you how they made the video. And it's basically from what I can gather, um, and I'm sort of technology is not my thing, but basically <laughs> f- from my idiot's, way of explaining it what they've done is they've taken um a a, a young actor to do the body moves in the video so you've got a guy that's basically most of it is shot down what looks like a corridor or corridors or passageways and you've got this young actor who's playing paul but he and he's doing these modern dance moves to this very contemporary sounding remix of this find my way song but the, the, the face of the young actor isn't of the young actor. It's superimposed with Paul, 78, 79-year-old Paul, who through the trickery of, of um, deep fakery has been made to look like Beatles-era 
as you say, 1960s Paul, mop top Paul, because he's got the mop top haircut and he's got the, the tie and the suit as, it, as the Beatles would have worn in 1964, 65. So he looks like, so it's an old Paul, but they've smoothed out the face and made him look like 1964 Beatle Paul, complete with the, with the mop top haircut. Similar to what, what they did with Diana Ross in the chain reaction video, isn't it? I don't remember that video. Well, it came out in 1986 and they'd made Diana Ross look like she was in her 60s heyday in black and white with a wig playing a sort of younger version of herself from 20 years before. Oh, yeah. Oh, I remember it now. Yeah, it was like her in the 80s as she's singing the song as it yeah. was just released. And then there was these black and white. But she still looked quite young back then. Well, there was she's, only 20 she's, years she's, difference, whereas there's nearly 60 years difference here. Exactly. Right. And, they've, and they've made him look. It's just what I find creepy about it is you've got this guy that you, you look at his face and you see Beatle Paul from the 60s. So you think of swinging 60s, black and white, um, Mary Quant, Carnaby Street. You think of old world. Yeah. But right. he's dancing to contemporary music and he's doing these really contemporary dance moves. So it's like it's really I find I just, it just creeps me out for some reason. You've got the it's past. <clears throat> Yeah, you've got the past mixing with the very present and it just looks, I just find that very unnatural and very uh, quite unsettling. But um, did you notice in it, you've got two Pauls? Mm -hmm. At the beginning, you see the current Paul, the 79-year-old Paul walking out of one door because it's a corridor. I think it's a hotel corridor. And, and there's, yes, yeah, it's, it's in the passageway of a hotel. Right. Um, and you've got all these doors and then out of one door, this is near the beginning. You've got the, the deep fake Paul singing and doing his dance moves at the front. And then behind you see the, the old Paul walking out, the, the elderly Paul walking out <laughs> of a door and looking at us and then walking through another door. And right. I, something else I noticed, right? At the beginning that you've got a, a um, hospital, hospital, hotel porter. And you know those trolleys they have in hotels where they put the luggage Right. The guests' cases and suitcases and everything. Did you notice that one of the suitcases was tartan? So I was <gasps> just thinking. So no. Is that, so I, I only noticed that the third time I saw it. So I'm just wondering whether that's a little bit of a reference to William Campbell. Perhaps. A little weak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, well so, spotted. So but that was on the third third or fourth look i saw that though you, you have to blink and you'll miss it it's that's the way subliminals there. work man yeah right. i know exactly but yeah. um, apparently what they did um i've got a quote here because it is quite complicated and um, this is from another article where they talk about how how the video was made the paul quote unquote the paul in the video is the product <laughs> of a digital process whereby editors were able to strip away the years leaving the beatles start as fresh faced as he was in the 1960s. The video is co produced with Hyperreal Digital, a production company specializing in the creation of hyper realistic digital avatars. Um, for for Sapor's new video, uh, Hyperreal created an avatar of the musician, which is near impossible to distinguish from the real thing. And of course, what people are now saying <laughs> within the PID community is, is that they're going to use this technology now to go back and look at old footage of Be the Beatles from pre-1966, pre-death Paul, and just right. mess around with them to make it look like they all look like Paul and none of them look like Will William or Billy or whatever. So, According to some, they already have. Yeah, yeah you know, yeah, so according to some, they have for a very long time. This is just now publicly being released to where public can actually, you know, use it or um, decipher between it, but they've actually had this type of technology for a very long time. We talked in an earlier episode briefly about how many times, as you say, as you said earlier, Mark, how many times we, we see in McCartney music videos, the use of doubles, like double pulls through the use of video trickery, perhaps, or not, perhaps it's not video trickery. Uh, in a lot of cases, it is video trickery, but also yeah. in wearing disguises. We see it in so many videos, like Pipes of Peace. We see two pulls, don't we? We see it's set in World War One during that time when it said that, the Germans and the British um, stopped fighting in the trenches and met together in the middle and celebrated Christmas Day. And the German officer that's leading the German troops is played by Paul with a moustache. And the British officer or sergeant or whoever he is who's leading the British troops is played by Paul again. So you've got Without these two Pauls 
without a moustache, yeah. Right. And if you notice in the photographs of that, if you, if you, watch, if you get the, 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 the press photos for that video, you'll see they're shaking hands. Notice that they're doing a, a Masonic handshake in that. Mm -hmm. um, I might be wrong, but... Um, yeah, anyway, right. looking at yeah, it, right. it, it, it does look that way, doesn't it? And the mm -hmm. ever-present past, which was the single from, um, was it Memory Almost, Almost Full? from right. 2007 in that video you've got multiple pools and again similar to the find my way video it's it's set in a museum i think and basically you've got paul quote unquote walking mm -hmm. through these various rooms in a museum and in each of these rooms there's people dancing to the song behind him like this dance troupe that sort of choreographed dances to the song all, and he, they all look like stella mccartney have you noticed that no all the women all the women look like stella mccartney and oh my goodness yeah talk there's about various yeah. calls that walk in and out yeah it's exactly very it's very strange like find my way video but in mm -hmm. this case in the ever present past video you see it more there are cases there are instances in the video where you see another paul walk into the room where when the other paul you see two pauls at the same time so you see one paul singing and then whilst he's singing and walking through these museum rooms, all these various walking rooms, through, he'll, yeah. He'll, yeah, he'll stop in one room. And whilst he stopped there, another Paul will walk in through another doorway and they'll, you'll see two at the same time. And that keeps happening in that video as well. Right. Um, and of course, Spies Like Us, the theme mm. tune to the, the film, the, the so-called comedy film. I think it's pretty lousy myself, but um, it stars Dan Aykroyd and Chevy Chase. <laughs> this came out in 1985, I think. And it's basically a comedy film about the so-called Cold War and Dan Aykroyd and Chevy Chase play these bumbling American CIA spies. I don't know if they're CIA or whatever. But yeah, uh, McCartney um, recorded the theme for that. And the video, mm -hmm. the, the music video for that is actually at Abbey Road Studios. And throughout that video, you've got McCartney and Chevy Chase and Dan Aykroyd wearing disguises and ripping masks off their face in it as well um yeah, and in and in that you see multiple pools uh, not at the same time they haven't used video trickery to show all the pools in one shot but you'll see for example he's in abbey road um performing the song for the video and you'll see him on guitar one second and then a second later you'll see him on the drums and then you'll see him say on another guitar um and i suppose it sounds like the coming up video as well Exactly. Yeah, you get that in the coming up video. Mm -hmm. and, and in both cases, I suppose, um, people who don't buy into PID will say, oh, yeah, but the reason that they're doing that is because coming up the song and Spies Like Us, the song, Paul McCartney plays all the instruments on those songs. Right. So it's basically Paul's way of saying, hey, look, everybody, I play all the instruments on these songs. So that's why I'm playing, you know, you see multiples of me. It's because I'm playing all the instruments. It's just my way of expressing There's also that. the wonderful Christmas time video where you get two yeah. pools facing each other. And at first you think, oh, it's a mirror image. But when you study the profiles and the shape of the yeah. notes and stuff, They're you realise, no, it's two different people. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And in the Spies Like Us video, right at the end, they do a, they do a mock-up of the Abbey Road cover. Um, of course, the Abbey Road album cover, which is steeped in PID law. Um, yeah, if you, if you look at the end of the video, you've got Dan Aykroyd, Chevy Chase and Paul McCartney crossing the Abbey Road zebra crossing. And if you look, I think it's, I think it's um, Dan Aykroyd at the back is barefoot. He's not wearing <laughs> shoes or socks. And if you look in the back, you've got a white Volkswagen Beetle parked up on the curb. So, <laughs> you know, it just goes on and on and on, doesn't it? Um, yeah. But you also get the ripping of the mask in, in Find My Way, in the Find My Way video. Um, if you look at that right at the end, and you get this in the Spies Like Us video, you'll, in the Spies Like Us video, there's a segment where you'll see Paul, if it is Paul, um, with a mask on. And he, he puts uh, like his hand under his chin and he rips the mask off and then it, underneath the mask is Chevy Chase or Dan Aykroyd I think and then he puts his hand under the mask and he under his chin and he rips his head off and it's basically saying it's a mask so it's not Chevy Chase it's a mask and underneath that is Dan Aykroyd well that's that's similar to what happens in the Find My Way video right at the end this video this deep fake pull once the song has stopped and this guy stops dancing this deep fake pull stops dancing he looks at the camera and he puts his hand under his chin and he rips the face off and throws it to the floor and it's a rubber mask. 
with complete with the mop top Beatles mop top hair. And then we look at who's underneath the mask and it's none other than Beck. Right. Uh, the guy that actually remixed the song. It's actually an interesting connection <laughs> between Beck and um, Yoko Ono. Um, apparently Beck's grandfather uh, is Al Hansen, was Al Hansen. Al Hansen was a part of the avant-garde art movement, movement in the 1960s known as the Fluxus Movement. Oh. Now, the, as you know, Desiree, the Fluxus Movement, Mark, as you know, the Fluxus Movement was um, uh, 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 an avant-garde art movement that was very, very uh, active in the 1960s. I think it's still going mm. now, but in the 1960s, this was before she met John, Yoko Ono was part of this, this movement, this Fluxus mm -hmm. art movement, but apparently so was Al Hansen. And Al, Beck's grandfather, was, was a collaborator and a friend of Yoko Ono's. Interesting. Um, so that's an interesting little link there. Apparently in during the Second World War, when um, Al Hansen was stationed in Frankfurt, <laughs> interesting place to be uh, stationed, uh, when he was uh, stationed in Frankfurt during the Second World War, he, um, he came up with this idea, um, this happening. Um, uh, and as you may know, what happening basically is, it's, it's, um, it's uh, an avant-garde term for a living... It's, art. It's, it's the art, yeah. It's... it's, yeah. it's unlike it's like a sculpture or a painting but a living piece of art so whereas you might look at a sculpture and it's there and it's inanimate and you watch it and you look at it and it's there forever or the same with a painting a happening is something that actually happens but it's deemed to be an artistic uh, exhibit if you like uh, yeah so this happening yeah um with with regarding al hansen in, in in frankfurt i think it was in 1945 actually this is while he was serving during the second world war he did decided to to perform a happening and basically what his happening was he went up uh, a few stories in a building i think a four-story building and he wanted to he wondered what it would sound like to hear uh, a piano fall to the ground right oh. um this is just so avant-garde it's what the avant <laughs> it's what the avant-garde's all about isn't it so um so yeah so that's what he did in frankfurt in 1945 whilst he was serving in world war ii he went up this four-story building and he pushed the piano out and and that was it and this is something that he performed this piece of performance art this happening is something that he repeated again over many years and he named it the yoko ono piano drop <laughs> so it just I've shows how <laughs> so it just shows you know how um connected he was to, to yoko ono and and through yoko ono in later years he got to know john lennon as well in the late 60s and i think they worked together as well they might have done an exhibition together as well but he certainly knew him and interestingly just to put a cap on this particular guy um beck's grandfather he was he i think he left the army after the war finished and then he decided again you know you know when we talk about military connections and all that i think it might be worth mentioning this um according to hansen himself he rejoined the army when he, he joined the air, the air force from december 1951 to december 1955 um yeah it's just one of those things i just thought i'd mention it as someone who decides to join the air force you know and then leave after four years um <laughs> yeah like um, you do like you do but mm. um there are some PID links to McCartney 3, aren't there? The, the, the latest album from the trilogy. Um, sure. If you, if you look at the front cover, um, you have a, a dice with the number three on it, with the three dots. But of course, am I not wrong in thinking that a dice is more than one dice, isn't it? Right. And it's yes. Die. So one dice is a die. So you've got three die on the front mm -hmm. of McCartney 3. So yeah so people who aren't into the pid thing will say oh yeah that's because it's mccartney three okay <laughs> but why did he choose a die you know so basically the message there is we're being told that he's saying three die as in you know um john george and paul are dead okay so that's three die one and live. Stu Sutcliffe. and Stu Sutcliffe, yeah and pete best why don't people regard him as a beetle because he was a beetle an right. ex-Beatle, but he was a Beatle, and I think it's a bit unfair to leave him out of the picture to and say he that he wasn't. India, too. Exactly, Mona Best was Indian, wasn't she? His mother was <laughs> yeah. Indian. Yeah, Best got a really raw deal after Neil Aspinall knocked up his mother. And right. Yeah. Kind of had to be kicked yeah. out and consigned to the rubbish bin of history. Right. Yeah. 
again, it's like the Maharishi thing we were talking about earlier. It's all very murky, isn't it? It is. It is murky. It's on purpose. Yeah, I just, what's going on there? Will we ever know? Um, With regards to McCartney, he made some comments at a press conference recently about conspiracy theories and claimed that this young girl that uh, was recounting a part of Beatles history had got her you know, her facts wrong and got things <laughs> screwed up. Just, just recount that one for us, if you would, Matt. Okay, well, I've actually transcribed this onto my website, The Occult Beatles. It's one of my most, as we speak today, February uh, 2022, it's my most recent article. It's called McCartney Gets Accosted by a Conspiracy Theory. Um, and he, this, he was doing a, a, he's done a number of speaking engagements to plug his new uh, lyrics books set, which is actually two books, a two volume book released at the same time. Um, and he's been doing the rounds, you know, doing the promotional rounds to, to push this book. And he appeared at the South Bank in London. And actually, you can find this on video. Basically, he says, and this is right at the end, this is pretty much before they sign off the, the live talk. He says, you know, the thing is, you know, once you write a song, once I have finished the song, then you kind of release it to the world. So I don't worry what happens to it. And some strange myths happen to these things. But I think I have come to terms with the fact that not everyone is going to get it, like the meaning that I had. Uh, they're going to put their own meanings on it. And I think you have to accept that. I mean, I was on holiday once with, I was on a beach and there was a little kid, a little American girl. She must have been all of eight years old. And so I was trying to be sort of nice and friendly. She said, oh, you're a beetle. And I said, yeah, yes, I am. And she said, I've just been learning about you in school. And I said, oh, what was it? And she told me a story that wasn't true. It was one of those kind of, you know, like conspiracy theories. And I said, well, no, let me put you straight. I said, I'm one of the Beatles, you see. I was there. What really happened was, and she said, no, I learned it in school. So it must be true. Okay, so you, you kind of have to let it go, you know. It's, it's just good that, they, they're, that they're even talking about it or listening to it. So I just wonder what that conspiracy theory was. They're not teaching Paul is dead in schools now. It's not part. Isn't of the it school maddening curriculum. that he doesn't reveal what the story was? What was it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> exactly. What was it? What was it? Um, you know, with you know, if it was about Paul is dead, I don't know. I mean, I, I, something I have noticed about these the trilogy of the Paul McCartney albums. These these like McCartney, McCartney two, and I've noticed that there is. I don't know. Maybe I'm just imagining it. Maybe I have, maybe someone else mentioned it and it was in my subconscious and I'm, and I should be crediting someone else for this, but yeah, certainly if you look on McCartney three, you will see the die with three die. Mm -hmm. So that's quite interesting. And then as you said, Mark, you've got McCartney two. Okay. People who don't buy into PID will say, well, of course he called it McCartney two because it's the second in the trilogy. You know, it's the second, you know, so he's calling it McCartney two. What else do you, expect him to call it McCartney Z or Z, you know, so, okay. But if you look on the back of the front cover of the, of the, the vinyl edition, I think you can find this on the CD maybe as well. You've got McCartney's face cut into two and you've got one half of his face on the left and one half on the right. So again, that could be, you know, you know, it could be seen as McCartney is dead. Clues. And then if you look even on the, on the front, on the front on the, of that album, it, what it's it's i thought it was just his face on the front just it is full. his face but if you look closely in the back there's two shadows there's a head like the, oh, the his head has two shadows so it's like there's two sitting there i'm sure it's just like a cross of the light but it, it's casting two shadows of one head oh, my so it's goodness. like you know it's it's to me that's an obvious kind of why would he choose to do that right okay you know and right, even on even on this McCartney three, if you take a look, first of all, the die is turned to the side. So it's like a, like a, a pyramid or like a triangle, right? And if you really, really zoom in on those three dots of the die, there's a weird um, kind of reflection inside of those dots. And yeah. if you really, really look at it, it almost looks like it's um, like set on water and there's like a, um, like a reflection of light going up to the water to almost like a pyramid that's on fire or like a volcano or something. If you really, really zoom in on those dots, it's really, it's, it's very odd and interesting, but it's just, you know, 
he didn't have to put that in there. It could have just been a solid black dot. You know, why, why do they choose to add these little tiny details if they weren't actually yeah, exactly. supposed to be put in there? You exactly. know, it was like a conscious decision. I mean, even with the first one, and I might, when I was getting ready for this podcast with you guys a few weeks ago, I started re-examining the, the covers to McCartney 1, 2, and 3. And I, I thought to myself, all these years, I thought to myself, there's nothing really to see on McCartney, the first one, on the cover. But you know what? There actually is. If you, I might be wrong. I, maybe, like I was saying earlier, do you remember I said I might be reaching into my subconscious here that maybe I've picked this up from somebody else. And maybe I have picked up this concept from somebody else. I don't know. Apologies to anyone who's listening who came up with this idea and, I'm, and I appear to be stealing it from you. I'm not. It's just I don't remember where I got this idea from. Maybe it was from me. Or maybe like McCart- McCartney, I got it in a dream. But um, <laughs> I'm, side- I'm sidestepping there. But if you look at McCartney 1, that is a really weird album cover. What is going on there? You've got mm-hmm. this white diagonal stripe um, that's vertical. Uh, and it's, it could be a work surface. It's white. It could be a table. But the background is black. But whether the black background is real or whether it's been made to look black with um, post photo um, editing, maybe it was a table. Maybe it was just a white table and they they made the rest of it black and left a stripe of white to make (laughs) it look like a stripe. Or whether it's a plank of wood that's been painted white. I don't know what's going on there. I really don't. But if you look on that on top of that white surface, you've got a bowl and outside of the bowl are a load of red cherries mm-hmm. glacé cherries as we might say um now what's that what's that term life is like a bowl of cherries mm-hmm. that, that old saying well what if life is like a bowl of cherries what's what is it if they're not in the bowl is that death right, right? um yeah. and if you look in the bowl you've got the juice from the cherries that remain oh, wow. that are remaining from the cherries <laughs> that have been taken out and put on the white surface well that that's red juice and that could be deemed to be blood right. now what if and again apologies if i've stolen this from somebody else this idea and it's just lodged in my subconscious and i think and it's me and i'm thinking that I've, it's actually my idea but it's actually not apologies for that but what if that white this right this album that came out mccartney was the the first album by mccartney we're told if it is mccartney that came out straight after the abbey road album because we know okay let it be was the last album by the Beatles, but it was actually but abbey road was released in 69 let it be was released in 70 but as we know let it be was actually recorded in 69 it was recorded before abbey road so basically technically speaking abbey road is their last album as the beatles before they split so right. if you regard it in that respect so you've got mccartney the first album he's released straight after abbey road solo album what have we got on the cover we've got a white vertical uh stripe with what could be blood in a bowl and so we've got this white vertical line that's a little bit diagonal and we've got a black background either side what if that is a close-up a photographic representation of a close-up of the zebra crossing from abbey road which is absolutely festooned with all these pid clues what if this is a continuation of the Abbey Road album um, PID clues. Absolutely. I'm just, I'm just putting it out there. I don't know. I don't know. Well, very That's profound observation be. about life is a bowl of cherries. So if they're out of the bowl, then is that death? Yeah, certainly. Right. I don't know. I, I could be talking out of my, <laughs> talking out uh, my backside, but um, I think it's a, a great observation. And yeah, it's yeah. a spilled out bowl of cherries on the zebra crossing. You got and, it. And um, I think we should just also mention that the, the, the McCartney 3 album was reissued on vinyl not that long ago, and they, and they only printed or published 333 copies of it. Go figure. Yeah. I wonder why. And the and 33 what, and a third inch yeah. record, right? Yeah, and Freemasonry. Right. And basically what they did is, apparently what they did um, is they took all the old vinyls of McCartney 1 and 2, and they they destroyed them they they crushed them into bits to make the vinyl of mccartney 3 so basically the the, the vinyl that makes up mccartney 3 these 333 three, three copies of them are made up from the dead 
um, remains of McCartney two. one and McCartney two. Right. So like Do, this like this reminds me of a couple of things that have come up in my research. First of all, there's the testimony of this guy, John Todd, known as John Todd Collins, speaking back in the 1970s. He's from one of these important so-called Illuminati bloodline families. And he was a witch, uh, you know, practicer of, a practitioner of sorcery and such. And he made these comments, which have become very famous in conspiracy circles now, about this practice that they used to have within all the major record labels of taking the master tape of a recording and putting it into uh, uh, an altar room. And they'd bring in a coven of witches to cast a dark hex upon this master recording. And then all the other copies would get made from that recording, presumably carrying some of that dark energy and putting it out into the general public there. And there was an album that was put out by the Foo Fighters many years ago. Very suspect group, Dave Grohl, a very suspect character. And as part of the limited edition CD version of this album, they included little ground up parts uh, minute little parts of the master tape recording. So there were these little slivers of quarter inch reel tape put into the jewel cases of the CDs. And my mind went back to what John Todd was saying about how they put all this dark energy into the master tape recordings. And then you got the story of these little slivers of tape going into these CDs. So I'm thinking, hmm, could that be the same uh, principle at play here? And now you've just mentioned vinyl copies of this album being all chopped up and little tiny parts of these being put out in these limited edition 333 copies. So could there be a connection there or is my mind just reaching too much? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't let's, know if that can be answered. Yeah, let's reach together. Um, but, you know, it's, it's like rebirth, isn't it? It's like death and rebirth because you're taking dead matter from something you've destroyed and you're giving it new life. So it's like death and rebirth. So it feeds into that as well with this McCartney thing, these albums being repressed. There's that kind of theme running mm-hmm. through it, yeah. which um, could take us potentially into ancient Egyptian um, beliefs, um, which, of course... It said the Beatles might have picked the word beetle, as in the name beetle from the scarab beetle, which in ancient Egyptian times was deemed like uh, a, a, a very, very important sacred deity right. um, be- because mm-hmm. of the fact that it rolled its own dung. It rolled dung into the shape of a ball and it, it, its young, it's the eggs of its young would be born within the dung. So basically you're giving birth from from dead matter you're giving life once again through the eggs so it's like the, the, a dead piece of matter is is giving birth again to something else so it's rebirth you know? this might be a great segue into george martin here and his son gregory paul martin because george martin had a coat of arms designed for him a family coat of arms i think it was quite oh, yeah. it was later on in his life in the 1990s i think and this coat of arms featured three beetles of sort of Egyptian mythology, those scarab beetles, but only three. Why not four? Yeah. So then you've got George Martin's son, his firstborn son, Gregory Paul, interesting name, Martin. And he narrated the audiobook version of the memoirs of Billy Shears, which purports to be the tell-all autobiography of the individual that's been playing the public role of Paul McCartney since the original Paul died, according to that theory. And he's a very interesting character to study is Gregory Martin, because he appeared on an episode of James Dellingpole's Dellingpod podcast a few months ago. And he's talking about astrology and how he's into this and he designs astrological charts. And he's talking about how he's had many previous lives. He's, he's lived many times before. Dellingpole doesn't really press him on this point, but they make reference to him having voiced the audiobook versions of memoirs. And Gregory Martin tries to distance himself from the whole Paul is dead conspiracy theory. And he basically says the whole thing is nonsense. It's ridiculous. He's got no time for it at all. So why then did he voice the audiobook version of the the book that purports to be the tell-all autobiography, you know? But I mentioned Gregory Martin in my new book, Musical Truth 3, because he's had quite a few interesting things to say on his social media, notably his Twitter in recent times. He's basically been calling out the whole Convid scandemic for what it is. 
and absolutely tearing apart the official narrative, which is a rare thing for any public figure to do. And uh, I've also quoted him as promoting this autobiography of his own that he put out. Uh, Now, what's it called? Isn't it a pity? So this autobiography came out in 2020, and he posted some uh, blurb to his Facebook page to promote it. And one of the things he posted was, uh, and I quote, Time and again, my father, George Martin, swore he was done, that he would never work with Paul again. Time and again, going back on his word, because they were friends and lovers. The last time, driving down to Macca's Sussex farm for a fascinating confrontation. If you want to know what transpired between them that day, buy my memoir, which I haven't yet, so I don't know what it says. Uh, But he also says, the seven deadly sins, also called the seven capital sins or seven cardinal sins in Roman Catholic theology, are the seven vices that spur other sins and further immoral behavior. The first is superbia, vainglory or pride and that is the force that has our world in a vice-like grip no one more guilty of it than sir james paul mccartney i love paul the world would be a much darker place without his incredible music but a little humility from him would not go amiss and then just one final quote that i'll throw in here with reference to john and yoko He says, one of the many reasons God put me on the earth was to speak the truth and set the record straight for those who cannot do it for themselves. John Lennon died a very unhappy man for the latter part of his life, stuck in a relationship that was a hollow sham, unable to free himself from its clutches. To those of you who refuse to believe this, I say you can't handle the truth. So there's a few things there. And I'll just finish by saying that on that Delling Pole podcast, he also talks about his uh, astrology readings. And he says he's done the chart of Boris Johnson. And the chart shows very strongly that by April of this year, so just a few weeks from us recording this, Boris Johnson's time will be up in a very violent manner. And he says that he foresees a lynching and he's not talking metaphorically. So, mm-hmm. interesting, huh? Well, <clears throat> yeah. I've looked at his Twitter page, and he's absolutely scathing about the so-called uh, corona situation, you know. Is, um, yeah. Absolutely scathing. I did look on his Twitter page a few weeks ago in preparation for this, what we're doing now, and it, it was gone. It was made private. I thought, oh, no. And then I looked at a few weeks later, and it was back on again. So... But yeah, he's absolutely scathing. Um, He gives, I mean, I've I've got a few of his tweets here. From January 27th, he says, the arrival of the truck convoy in Ottawa is the beginning of Trudeau's end. This must happen all over the world if we're going to bring this monstrous global deceit to an end. They are murdering your children and will stop at nothing. Neither therefore should you. And on December the 8th, he states, you want to stop this satanic madness? It's so goddamn simple. Man up, own the Christ within you. Your mind is your kingdom. Take it back, occupy it. They're trying to tell you, you have no kingdom, no rights. This is the highest price and the practice of the dark arts. It is the biggest lie. Um, and, and, and so on and so on. He's, he's, he's um, in a number of tweets uh, over the last year. He's also shared his support for people across the world uh, protesting against the so-called vaccine passports. Also, he's shown sympathy for people who've died or have been taken seriously ill after taking the jab. Um, He's also taken swipes at uh, Fouch, Chris Whitty, Matt Hancock, Boris Johnson, who he calls a sly, culpable villain, the Great Reset and the mainstream media and its so-called propaganda. Um, Yeah, Bill Gates, you name it. He's he's, he's launched into quite a few people with his tweets, yeah. And you were saying, Matt, that he was left out of his father's will, apparently, and Giles Martin uh, seems to be the de facto Beatles official producer following his father's passing, and it's all gone to Giles, and uh, maybe that's why Greg feels to speak out as openly as he does, because he feels he doesn't have a whole lot to lose. Yeah, maybe. Or maybe the reason that he he was left out is because he's got these views. Maybe he's always had these views all along, Um, and maybe... George Martin, his father, didn't want him to be. It's, it's, I don't know what's going on. Apparently, um, what, what the story is, I, I don't know how much of this is true. A lot of it is according to allegations by various people and press reports. So I don't know how much of this is true or not true. But 
what is true is what we do know anyway is that George Martin was married twice and in both of his marriages he had two children with his first marriage he had um his wife was Jean uh, she was called Sheena for some reason that's what they, everyone called her um and and it was in his first marriage that Gregory was born into he was born into the first marriage as and and so was his sister I think she's older than him her name's Alexis and then Sometime in the late 50s, early 60s, George Martin started having an affair with, I think she was a secretary at EMI Studios at Abbey Road, um, as it was known then, before it was called Abbey Road Studios, because it got called Abbey Road Studios after the fame of the Abbey Road album by the Beatles. Then it got the, they decided to rename the studios Abbey Road, but before then it was just called EMI Studios. And George was there in the late 50s, early 60s. Uh, he started an affair with um, Judy Lockhart Smith, who was, I think she was a secretary there. And so he was having an affair with her and he was married to Sheena. And eventually they, they uh, Judy and he got married, I think in 65, 66 thereabouts. And then they had a couple of kids, one of whom was Giles, Giles Martin, who was born in 1969. And he's effectively, as you say, he's taken on the mantle um, of being kind of like the unspoken official producer of the Beatles following George Martin's death. In fact, he started to take over that role whilst George Martin was still alive. But in his later years, when he was quite elderly and, and not very well, his, his health was failing him. So Giles stepped in from, from that point. But now that George Martin has passed away, I think he passed away in 2016. Since then, um, Giles has effectively become the de facto official Beatles producer. So all the remastering we've had since George's death, you know, the remastering box set albums of Abbey Road, the White Album, uh, Get Back, Let It Be, and all of that, Sergeant Pepper, that's mm -hmm. all been Giles Martin doing that. Um, so basically what happened was when George died in, I think it was 2016, um, he left a million pounds and about, um, I think it was 325,000 pounds of that was divided amongst his family. And the only child that I'm aware of that didn't get any money out of it was Gregory. Uh, no reason that I'm aware of has been given as to why Gregory was left out of it. Um, <laughs> although it has been suggested in the press that there was a feud between the two of them. Um, Gregory's an actor uh, as well. He's, he's appeared in uh, various TV shows. He appeared in Ellen, um, also Mad About You, Sliders, Babylon 5, Murder, She Wrote. Um, and he's appeared in a number of movies. And apparently, according to his website, he was actually interviewed for the role of James Bond before Timothy Dalton got it. Mm. Um, but apparently he was too young to take on the role. They, they thought he was too young. But actually, according to Gregory himself, he was actually considered to take on the role of James Bond. But um, yeah, apparently they, he didn't get on with his father. There's allegations that he... George Martin had lent him a hundred thousand pounds when he was a, a lot younger because Gregory was a bit of a playboy. He liked to live the high life and he blew his money and went bankrupt. So he fell out with his dad over this, over this debt. He, you know, this, this, you know, this hundred thousand he lent him or whatever or gave him. I don't know what the true story is, but apparently anyway, he's, he's, he's out of the will, but um, what there is, there is, a feud going on or well, there has been a feud going on between the the family of the first marriage and the family of the second marriage and um alexis gregory's sister i think his elder sister has also um weighed into this and claimed that um apparently um the the the, 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 the she and her mum you know the everyone from the first marriage from george's first marriage were basically ignored once george got married to, um, uh, to Judy Lockhart Smith in 65, 66, or whenever it was. From that point on, everyone in his first family was virtually ignored. And, 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 the way, and, and, and Alexis has actually spoken out in the press about all this. She claims that once he had kids and got married with, to Judy Lockhart Smith, they were basically the new celebrity family. They basked in the glory, basically, of him being the Beatles producer and the, the, the everyone in the first family was ignored and everyone in the second family basically got to live the high life and got to you know got to live the benefits of him being the beatles music producer and she claims she believes that george martin actually hid most of his fortune that she she believes there's absolutely no way and and this has been actually discussed on various other websites various other journalists have, have come to the same conclusion there's absolutely no way that george martin would have left 
in such a glittering career, he would have just left one million pounds in his will. She believes that he left 400 million and that it's all been siphoned off to offshore accounts. Uh, now, this isn't according to me. This is according to what she stated in a couple of interviews for the media some years back. She believes that he probably left more in the re uh, money, more to the region of 400 million, and it got siphoned off to offshore accounts. Um, and, and, that, that, and this was to the benefit of his second family. Basically, his second family, Giles and Judy and so on, are, are reaping the benefits of this secretly. And that everyone from his first marriage, including Gregory, of course, who got nothing, are, you know, are, are suffering as a result of it. Um, it I, I don't want to jump in and say, yeah, she's right, because, you know, it's very dicey ground to make allegations like this, you know. Um, I don't want to get into any hot water, but... You know, it, it is true that George Martin was a very successful producer. Now, it is known, as from what I'm aware, from having read a little bit about EMI Studios in the 1960s, apparently if you were a record producer, like George Martin was a record producer at, at EMI when, when he joined in the 50s and into the early to mid 60s, before he left and went freelance, apparently he, he only got paid a salary. And, and, and given that he'd re released all, he'd recorded all these hits for all these artists, the Beatles, Cilla Black, Jerry and the Pacemakers and all these others. He didn't actually get any royalties. He was only paid a salary. So it, whereas in America, apparently in the 60s, if you were a record producer in America, if you produced a hit, you would get what was called points. You would actually get um, a share of the profits from the sales and from the royalties of it being a hit record, a hit album or a hit single. Not right. the case in the UK. But having said that, George Martin did leave EMI in 1965-66 and he, he went freelance. He still worked at Abbey Road as a producer, but he was working freelance. He wasn't working for EMI. So when he was working with the Beatles on Sgt. Pepper, all the post-66 albums like Sgt. Pepper and the White Album and Abbey Road and so on, these, he was working as a freelance. He was working at Abbey Road, but he was freelance. And he was working as part of a new enterprise that he'd I set see. up called Air Studios, Associated Independent Recordings. Now, the thing with Air Studios is it is one of the most respected recording studios, recording setups in the world, and it still runs to this day, post George's, you know, passing. Uh, I've got a list here of some of the artists that have recorded there. Uh, Pink Floyd, Queen, Paul McCartney during his solo career, Kate Bush, Sex Pistols, T-Rex, Genesis, ELO, Supertramp, Dire Straits, Elton John, The Police, Rolling Stones, Duran Duran, Lou Reed, Eric Clapton, Black Sabbath, and it's also now used predominantly for soundtrack work, for Hollywood hit movies and TV shows and all that kind of thing. So basically what Alexis is saying is there is no way he would have just left one million pounds. Something something amiss <laughs> is going on there you know and it's to the it's to the detriment of, of gregory and his side of his family basically right and it, it kind of sounds similar um, it sounds more extensive but it also sounds kind of similar to john and his first family right, right? yeah the way he treated them through yoko uh, after his death and all that too so wasn't oh, no. it Julian Lennon, John's first son? He had to take Yoko to court for many years in order to get a share of, of John's um, estate. Didn't anything, he? right? Anything, yeah. yeah. He wasn't allowed to get, you know, any of the memorabilia or just any photographs or memories of any sort. And then he had to take her to court in order to get anything. So. Yeah. So, so whether Gregory was, it could be because of his playboy lifestyle that the press claims the press claims he had a playboy lifestyle and george martin wasn't wasn't happy about this so he gave him a hundred thousand pounds and apparently said to him that's it that's all you're getting you're not getting anything after this whether it's due to george martin not being happy with his son's lifestyle i don't know or is it or it could like i said earlier is it because he held views like the views we've expressed he's expressed mm -hmm. on his twitter page is it because he's alternative thinking is it is it because of that that he's um He's been left out of their family. I don't know. Um, I don't know. We like people like that. Yeah, we do. <laughs> we need more of it. I noticed a couple of other interesting, these are music related tweets that um, Gregory posted up on Twitter about a year or so ago. As I say, he's, when it comes to Corona and all that kind of stuff, he's absolutely on point. 
Um, he also has a go at Greta Thunberg. He says, she's not a person, she's a construct. This is one of his tweets from October 8th, 2021, I think. Greta Thunberg is not a person, she's a construct. Klaus Schwab's construct, if Thunberg did not exist, he'd have to invent her, and indeed he did. Uh, but he also has um, swipes at Bono. And there's a photo. Oh, I like it more and more. <laughs> <laughs> there's actually a good quote somewhere, but I think I've lost it. It's on one of my other bits of paper. I think it's something like, um, what's the difference between Jesus and Bono? Um, Jesus doesn't walk down Dublin telling people he's, he's Jesus. Um, <laughs> um it's another one from from gregory's tweets but um yeah he's also got a photo in one of his tweets from october last year from 2021 and it's a picture of him of his wife sorry his wife sheree backstage at the tv talent show the uk tv talent show the show the voice uk um with will i am so it's a picture of um sheree with will i am and i think will i am is I might be wrong, but I think he produces The Voice. I think he's got something to do with it. He actually finances that show, that so-called talent show. But um, yeah, Gregory Martin, on top of this photograph that's got Cherie backstage with um, Will I Am, he states, here's my missus with Will I Am. This was backstage at The Voice UK before I knew how deeply involved he is with Davos. Um, so that's interesting. And another one is on October the 4th of 2021 under a photo of Bono and Mick Jagger singing together. He states, it's giving me such enormous pleasure removing every single song by this monstrous pair of criminals from my music lab uh, library. Jagger's 56th birthday party was where I met Bono, the same party attended by Bill Gates and Jeffrey Epstein. Uh. Um, uh, Will I Am is very much in the pocket of Klaus Schwab. He's attending all yeah. these WEF meetings. There's photographs of him at these Davos clicks and stuff. So, yeah, yeah. Shill I Am, as I call him. Yeah, definitely. Oh, oh, for, for sure. Um, but just to throw a little bit of um, wee wee, bit of piss into the <laughs> into the parade. Um, <laughs> he's got this in another post from November of 2021. He's got a picture of Steve Tyler. Um, and again, it's Steve Tyler from Aerosmith. You know, we, we know his, we're, um, I think we're aware of his history with uh, the younger sex mm -hmm. uh, of the female uh, persuasion. Yeah. 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 Um, so he's got a picture of Steve Tyler um, doing the OK hand sign or otherwise known as 666. Yeah. And he's, it's a picture of Steve Tyler next to his wife, Cherie, again. And he says, he states, Steve Tyler, a member of the Illuminati, I don't think so. He's one hell of a fun guy to be around, though. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, mixed and there's also messages, a picture. Mark. Yeah, mixed messages. And there's also a picture of Cherie, his wife, with Jeff Emmerich, who was the Beatles sound engineer. He was, right. he was the engineer on many, many of their albums. And I think he, after the, they split, he, he um, also was an engineer on, on a lot of um, quote unquote McCartney's um, uh, solo work as well. Uh, and this picture is of Cherie with Jeff Emmerich at Laurel Canyon. Um, <laughs> apparently, uh, Emmerich actually lived in Laurel Canyon. Uh, he passed away in 2018, and he, I think he <laughs> saw out his last days at his home in Laurel Canyon. And there's actually also a photo on, on Gregory's Twitter page of Gregory with Jeff as well in Laurel Canyon. Yeah, so that's a bit odd, you know, um, Laurel Canyon, uh, Gregory Martin and, and all of that. But um, yeah, there's, there's something I wish I'd screenshotted it. And this is to do with uh, Gregory again. Um, as you probably know, um, Gregory provided like the forward to the, the book Memoirs of Billy Shears. Um, right. um, this book that is supposedly the tell-all memoirs of Paul McCartney as told by his replacement, um, and put together by Thomas E.U. Harriet. And, and yeah, so Gregory put together this, the forward for that book. And he also narrated the audio version that came out a few years ago. Um, yeah, so that, that got people thinking, well, if he's doing that, that must mean, you know, that he's, he must be into this, that he must be into the, into Paul is dead. He must believe it. And right. I, wish, I wish I'd screenshotted it. And Oh God, it was on a Paul is Dead forum. I think it might've been on a Facebook Paul is Dead forum. Someone posted up, I don't know if they posted up a screenshot or whether they just printed the words, uh, like typed down the words, copied it and then put it onto on a, on a Facebook post themselves or how it was done. But apparently someone had 
from what I can gather, oh, I wish I'd saved it. From what I can gather, someone had actually approached Gregory Martin, I think it would have been on his Twitter page, and said to him, made the insinuation basically that Paul was dead because basically because Gregory had put so much work, you know, he'd put so much work into providing the forward and doing the voice uh, for, for the audio book. They, this person that sent this tweet to Gregory assumed that, well, if he's doing this, he must naturally believe that Paul is dead. And so that's what he suggested to Gregory on Twitter, I think. And at which point Gregory went absolutely ballistic along the lines of, and I'm paraphrasing here, but along the lines of, you must be mad if you think I, if you think I think Paul is dead. What? Just because I'm doing the voiceover for a book, it doesn't mean I think he's dead. I'm an actor for, you know, for pity's sake. I'm an actor. What? So every time I play a role in a film or a TV show, it doesn't mean that I believe that person is real, that he actually exists or doesn't exist. For goodness sake, you know, he absolutely went absolutely ballistic. Yeah. So I, I don't know what that was all about. So yeah, uh, it, it looks like, um, <laughs> yeah, he, he doesn't really go in for PID by the looks of it, but. Um, well, it was surprising when I learned that he did the audio, um, the audio version of that book too. Say, like, oh wow, well that's it's, it's almost interesting like, that he signed up for that in the first place. Exactly. It would, it would, um, it would suggest that he, he was into it, wouldn't it? That he, mm -hmm. Because otherwise, why would, oh, I don't know. Um, yeah, and, and he actually, according to the, for, this is the forward, right? This is the actual, this is what he, this is what he contributed to the memoirs of Billy Shears, right? Um, when it came out a few years back. It's since been re-released. It's since been reissued. It's got, a, a, they've done a bonus edition um, mm -hmm. that came out in November, I think, of 2021 or October. It's, it's been reissued with loads of extra stuff. Um, but um, apparently he says, when Thomas E. U. Harriet first approached me about narrating this book, I was curious. I had no idea such a strong belief was still prevalent in the Beatles subculture, that the rumour about Paul's death all those years ago was true. Exploring the possibility in the form of a novel seemed an intelligent way to address the subject, and the extent of Hugh Harriet's knowledge of the subject interested me. Um, as a gifted actor, I have a natural facility for mimicry. My version of Paul McCartney's voice came easily to me, especially since I have known him since I was five years old. I first met Paul in the winter of 1962, just a few months after my father, Sir George Martin, signed the Beatles to Parlophone Records. To record the memoirs, I thought it would be most fitting to use the original recording equipment that the Beatles had used at Abbey Road Studios with help from my father and from engineers Jeff Emmerich and Dave Harris. That equipment is now located at the prestigious British Grove Studio. So, what? And um, yeah, wow. so on, on several occasions during the recording process, while sitting at the same equipment to record this book that the Beatles and my father had used for their vast catalogue of songs, I felt I had become Paul. While this experience is a natural part of an actor's process, in this instance, with this subject matter, it felt uncanny. Is Paul dead? <laughs> I leave that to you to decide. Meanwhile, in Paul's words, let me introduce you to the one and only Billy Shears. <laughs> so, you know, if you're going to read that and, and you're going to hear him narrating this memoirs of Billy Shears as he did a yeah. few years back, you're going to think, you, you wouldn't be mad for thinking that he's going to be in on this. or that he's Yeah, gonna... he's on board. Yeah. Right. So, very, very weird. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So what's coming up, Desiree? What, what have you got coming up on your website? Oh, goodness gracious. Anything? Not too much. I have been a busy, busy bee with life and everything else going on. But I'm, I'm hoping that some uh, light of inspiration will come at some point and I can get something out there. But at this point in time, not too much is going on. I know you have a lot going on. So what do you got going on? <laughs> uh, you've got a spare couple of years um yeah, yeah there's, there's, I've, I've put up quite a few articles in recent times um and yeah i've got some more i've got a video presentation coming up um as we speak now february 28th it's not up now but it should be up um in the late part of march 2022 it's going to be on my youtube page conspiro tv i'll also post it to the occult beatles and basically i've hooked up with uh, a researcher by the name of andrew arnett 
and he very kindly linked he, he wrote an article a couple of years back uh, in 2019 to mark the paul is dead um conspiracy yeah, theory because that's 2019 is basically when when it when the paul is dead theory went mainstream wasn't it that's when it all kicked off basically even though there have right. been rumors of it before that 69 was the year it really kicked off so he wrote an article um looking into sort of marking the 50th anniversary of it in 2019 and he was he's got quite a unique take on the whole thing and he linked one of my articles on his site which was rather kind of him um and i looked at the, the article and I, I listened to a couple of his podcasts and he's got he's what he's done he's I think it's rather unique. He's linked Paul is dead with the Beatles in ancient Egypt, mm, mm -hmm. as we were mentioning earlier. So he's linked it into ancient Egypt and ancient Egyptian rituals and beliefs. And, and yeah. And also into Alistair Crowley. And he's got some rather unique um, perspectives on Paul is dead on the so-called clues that we see on the Abbey road cover and mm. Sergeant pepper and all that. He's, he's, he's looking at those covers again, he's re-examined them and he's, he's looking at the PID clues that are there, but he's also peeling the layers, as he says, paraphrasing him and, and, and seeing other connections there, connections linking it to ancient Egypt, to Crowley and to all these other bits and pieces. So, so yeah, I did a video presentation with him. We, we basically, we, we, we talked on zoom for a couple of hours and uh, we shared notes, swap notes, if you like, about our research into these sort of things and yeah that that should be coming up on youtube in a couple of in late march 2022 yeah so that that'll Great. be up so and there's lots oh. of other things too but um just to say quickly that we're very keen on anniversaries with these shows aren't we and we're in 2022 yeah. now uh which is the 60th anniversary towards the end of this year of 1962 when the whole beatles story got started in terms of uh, love me do being released and then being unleashed on the public so i guess we're gonna have a lot to talk about there maybe we should go back to the very early days of the group that'd be good because we could tie into george martin again and the true story according to mark lewison the Beatles historian of historians, he's found um, information to suggest that George Martin didn't actually sign the Beatles because of their talent, that he was forced into signing them. But um, oh. yeah, we could. <laughs> so that would make for some juicy information, perhaps. Interesting. Not just because he liked George's tie. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All that stuff about oh, George's story that he's, he's um, recited over the decades, yeah, about yeah. how he, he, he wanted to sign them, not because they were particularly good musicians, but because they were charming people. Well, yeah. apparently there was a little bit of blackmail involved, according to the research of um, Mark Lewis, and there was a little bit huh. of blackmail involved. He had to sign them, basically, otherwise he would have been out. Yeah, those early Beatles days are, are very, very interesting. That would be a great episode to go over. <laughs>